Ladies and gentlemen, this is David Maricatani. Welcome to episode 189. Our podcast is made possible by USA Wrestling, the national governing body for wrestling in the United States and sponsored by Nike Wrestling. Go to athleteps.com for all of your Nike and USA Wrestling branded gear. Mark, we've been talking almost every day off the air as we normally do this time of the year. Yep. Uh, I think your wife has a love-hate relationship with me. But, and, me. and me. Yeah, uh, I'll be getting out of her hair probably shortly here. Um, but we're going to go back and cover the last our reaction to the last three weights of nationals, yep. uh, our reaction on what happened to the team scores and everything like that, and uh, do a preview of the last chance qualifier and maybe talk a little bit about the, la the Olympic trials. So uh, a lot to okay. cover. We've got 44 minutes, so let's boogie. Uh, I don't remember what order we did this in, but I'll let you go first. 184, I'll read off the All-Americans. Aaron Brooks, 3-2 to two over Heidley for first. Uh, Parker Keckheisen takes third as the four seed over Jos John Posnanski, who was a absolute star at this tournament as the six seed. We thought he was overseeded, and we were wrong. Uh, the fifth place match was Dakota Gear as the 11th seed over Britt Wilson. And Hunter Boland takes seventh with a 6 to 3 decision over Louis Dupre. So a little bit of upheaval at this tournament. One wrestled two. Um, what were your thoughts on the bracket? I thought it was a great tournament at that weight. Uh, I guess what impressed me more than anything, and I think this kind of carries through to the whole tournament, David. We have some really good young true freshmen out there. Uh, Keck Eisen uh, against the Rutgers kid. I mean, they're both true freshmen and went out and put Keck, on a show. Keck Eisen's, all a red, week. Keck Eisen's a red shirt. Oh, he is? Yeah. Oh, I thought he was a true freshman. No, but okay, still freshman. My bad. No. Yeah. So, I mean, these guys are coming in. Uh, Keck Eisen beat Bolin, who we both thought had a really good shot at you know, pushing uh, Brooks there to get into the finals. Yeah. So it was just really impressive to see the young guys go out there and perform as well as they did. Um, I still think Brooks is the best. Uh, I didn't love the officiating in the match. I'm getting really tired of watching these kids go from the center of the mat and then want to wrestle on the edge the whole time. Um, I think they – one of the programs I listened to said that uh, Heidley was on the edge of the mat for almost two and a half minutes uh, during that seven-minute match. I mean, on the edge. with this Heidley was or Brooks was? Heidley was. Oh, well, then, then you can't complain about losing, right? No, you can't. And it's just, yeah. you know, but we saw that over and over again. Guys were going to the edge, and they weren't calling it. So that's something I hope I, we see changed. But I thought the weight, you know, there were some big surprises, obviously. And uh, I was impressed. Yeah, I think, like, we had Brooks in our uh, charity event a couple years ago. Couldn't be a nicer kid. And when you just watch him drill and flow, he's just so freaking smooth. And, again, you know, again, these guys, these elite guys at Penn State get better. Uh, we watched Keck Heiss and Russell at Big 12s, like Hardell and I and the guys in person. So we weren't surprised that he was – I thought he would lose to Bolin and come back through and wrestle really hard on the back because he's a grinder. Yep. Uh, you know, but he took him down in overtime. He gave Brooks a handful and then came through the back, uh, did some grown man things. So uh, this just came out – we're recording this Wednesday at 10 o'clock at night because I'm actually in Miami, Florida right now. Coaching uh, tomorrow, one of my guys is making weight, and then he's got a big MMA fight on Friday night. I'll give him a shout-out, David Evans, on UFC Fight Pass if you want to watch him fight. St. Louis is uh, pride and joy. So we're, you're recording this with me on Wednesday night so I can go do some coaching things tomorrow, which I appreciate. But on Wednesday afternoon, Hayden Heidley announced, A, that he's coming back, and B, he's bumping up to 174. Uh, I think he's going to just get huge. They said it was a huge cut for him. Uh, and, you know, he'll get to train with his brother probably a lot more effectively at 74 and 84. So I just bring that up because I think we're going to see a lot of these guys, like right now, you're in Iowa, a lot of those Iowa guys announced they're coming back. Uh, we haven't heard from Kemmer, but like DeSanto said he's back, Marinelli said he's back. So 
Uh, this was an interesting wait. It was, it was kind of chalky at the top. I think probably the biggest surprise to me was Bolin taking seventh and Deer not placing at all. And probably the biggest surprise on the upside for me was Keck Heisen getting to third. And uh, shout out to Britt Wilson from Mexico, Missouri. His high school coach wrestled for me and my dad. Super nice kid. Another kid that wrestled in Border Brawl. And uh, all these kids I had a chance to work with on the charity event. Literally every single one of them. The only kids that were jerks were kids we didn't have in the event. So it's easy to root for them. So sure. I'll go first at 197. Uh, you and me picked AJ Ferrari. I picked AJ Ferrari in our... Uh, Fantasy brackets, I picked him in the media pool, which you helped me with. Uh, all the picks I got right were mine. All the ones you helped me with were the ones that I missed, as usual. Of course. Um, <laughs> of course. No, but seriously, we both picked Ferrari. We just thought he was too big for a meet, and I think that was it. Like I said to you, like we were texting about him, like that's a 205-pound guy wrestling a 189-pounder, and he also doesn't wrestle in the tie-ups a lot where Amin does his best work. And if you go try to find him with your hands, you're going to get double leg to put on a poster. And he, and he commits to riding. Uh, somebody used that phrase to me about him. He commits to riding. He doesn't commit to turning, but he commits to riding. And his forward pressure is really impressive. And he used that against Jacob Warner. He used it against the mean. And he used it in the fi finals against Bonacorsi. Bonacorsi is the sixth seed. The bottom half of this bracket was chaos. Bonacorsi beats Norfleet, and then the bottom quarter was insane. Jacob Woodley beats Rocky Elam, and I'm going to talk about Rocky Elam. But then he beats Cam Caffey, and then he beats Michael Beard. Michael Beard beat Pence because Pence decided to just bot roll from the bottom and pin Eric Schultz in the first round of the tournament, which really hamstrung Nebraska. Um, Bonacorsi makes the finals. Ferrari kind of controlled that match. Third place match, Amin comes back through. Jacob Warner, for people, the nine people that didn't see this, got headlocked by Nick Renan and was on his back forever and got out. It sure looked from where I was sitting like he was pinned. Didn't look like there was any possible way he wasn't pinned. Uh, and he one point rolled, and there's no way to roll except to cross your back for a second. But he gets out. He's losing 6-0 when he gets out and comes back and takes it to overtime and wins the match. And there was probably some calls that could gone the other way. Uh, but Renan's got to be a little smarter there. You know, he, he can take an injury timeout. There's some things he can do. When he get hit with the stall call, just go out of bounds so you don't get taken down with no time left. Amin comes back. Uh, some really cool memes of him with the big black eye. Comes back to it, takes third. And I got to talk about Rocky Elam. Rocky Elam loses the first round. And then go 16-6, 4-3 over Noah Adams, 12-3 over Schultz, 9-1 over Norfleet, 5-0 over Beard, loses to Amin in overtime, and then beats Woodley for fifth, who was the guy that took him out. I know you wrestled, I wrestled. There's a couple tournaments where I took third and beat the guy that beat me and put me in the backside. And that's the most mortifying and satisfying thing at the same time because you're like, if I had done this the first time, I might have won the freaking tournament, but at least you get revenge. I agree. Uh, 197. David, I don't know if you remember this first time we did this podcast and we did the <laughs> rankings. I made a prediction at 197 that of the eight guys that they had seated at the beginning of the year. Right. But yeah, I think yeah. I said that six of them would not place at the national tournament. Uh, Actually, might have been seven. I'm not sure Bonacorsi was ranked in the top eight. The only one that placed that was actually ranked at that time uh, was Jacob Warner. Now, he actually was not one of my picks, but he came through and did it anyway. Yeah. Uh, and no, I did not – yeah, they, well, uh, Michigan was not at 97 at that time. I mean, so was the was, number one guy at 84. Yeah. Yes. So – you know, move him up. So there you go. Two of the guys that were ranked at the beginning of the year placed that tournament. The other ones, and we had talked about it, were all young guys that nobody knew a lot about. And Ferrari was one of them. Elam was one of them. Uh, Beard. 
Beard, Beard was one of them. Buchanan. Yeah, Beard kind of surprised me that he, he wrestled as well as he did because he didn't have a great Big Tens. But it was the younger guys that came through and performed. And we knew this wasn't a real deep weight for talent. We had no idea who was going to win until Amin moved up. And then we thought, well, okay, Amin's the best guy. But well, you, and well, I, you and I didn't. You and no, I did not. Well, we had saw Ferrari and how hard he was going to be for Amin to wrestle him because Ferrari wrestles from his knees. I just couldn't find a way that Amin was going to get to his legs. And that the only way you're going to beat him is to get to his legs and take him down. People are having problems getting to his legs. So well, with him, with Ferrari, it's not only getting to his leg, it's getting to your ties. And he's a guy, because he's so explosive, you're scared to find him with your hands. Like my dad would always teach us to find a guy with your feet, you know, like don't reach, you know, walk into him in good position. But Ferrari will blow right through you when you're in good position. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we both – the other thing is Stephen Buchanan beat Noah Adams four times this year. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. Like, Noah Adams, what, the only other guy he lost to was – who did he lose to on the back? Uh, was it Elam? Might have been. Yes, lost to him four to three. So he's yeah. got five losses this year, four to Buchanan and one to Elam. Buchanan does place eighth. So, you know, Wyoming gets a win all American. Let's go to heavyweight or 285. Gable Stevenson, fall, tech fall decision, major super controlled decision in the finals. Paris for your fantasy team, fall, tech fall, major fall. Really good pick in the second hole. Uh, wrestles to a seed. Cassiope is the five seed, takes third. He beats Colton Schultz twice. Colton Schultz takes fourth. Gannon Gremmel fifth. Trent Hilger from the 14 seed takes sixth. Kirk Fleet from the nine seed takes seventh. Orndorff uh, from the 21 seed takes eighth. Thoughts on 285? Uh, love the weight. Love the talent. We had talked about tears early on in this, David. And it's still the same. Uh, Gable's by himself on a tier. Tier one. Yep. Tier one. And Paris is on a tier by himself, tier two. And I said I thought Cassiope was on a tier by himself. You did. I'm still, I'm still gonna say that. I don't think nobody really wrestled with him. Uh, I know that the scores were 4-0 uh, against Schultz from Arizona State, but I mean there were he he never came close to. He won 9-1, 11-0, 4-1. 8-0-5-0. No one's close to him. Yeah. Like winning four to one is a lot different than winning 10 to seven. Yeah. I mean, there's three points, but it's a lot different. And we had talked about this when they did the seeds for this tournament and they put stencil in at three. And I thought Cassiope should have been at three. But Cassiope had three losses twice to uh, Gable and once to Paris and stencil was undefeated. Well, I mean, here's a perfect example. If you aren't wrestling the best guys, you don't belong up there with the best guys because we thought, I thought, and I guess everybody thinks now that Cassiope should have been the three seed. It's Not just hard, it though, matters. because St Stencil beat Zach Elam and he beat Ethan Laird. So it's not like he didn't beat anybody good. Those guys, Laird lost in the blood round to Orndorf. Um, I'm friends with the Mizzou guys. Elam beats Christian Lance. Then he gets Austin Harris, who beat Stencil. So you're like, oh, that's a great draw for Elam. Elam's winning the match. And then Harris goes all Alan Gelagayoff and pins him in the second period. Then he loses to Kirkfleet in the blood round. But this is part of Oklahoma State's story. Like, they had a guy score points. Like, Harris scored, you know, on the backside, you know, advance, 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 and a pin. It's three and a half points. And you can look at it and say, well, it didn't matter. But it's not how it feels at the time. Sure. Like, at the time, you're like, man, this dude's scoring points. He's staying alive for them. Yep. That's significant, you know? So And, it, and it, it does something for the other guys on the team. Hey, our heavyweight's scoring us some points. Let's go out. We're doing, you know, we're moving up the ladder. We're right there with Penn State. And they were till the finals. And then not yeah, so much. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, talked so much. To, I talked to Lee Pritz Saturday night, and he told me the deal they made with Schultz was he didn't have to work on top or bottom this year. Because he's getting ready for the Preco trials. 
Oh, so I think we can expect him to be a little bit better on the mat next year. No, I mean, I'm just telling you, like I've known Lee for 120 years and he's never lied yeah. to me. So, um, you know, anyway, so that's our thoughts. If you had to vote, I'll, I'll ask you this. If you had to vote for an outstanding wrestler of the tournament and an outstanding wrestler for the season, like the Hodge, who would your two votes be? Oh, Hodge or Spencer Lee. Um, and you know what? I was real close to saying Gable until uh, he only decisioned Kirk Fleet from Penn State. I uh, got taken down there in the third period, ended up winning, was it seven to three or seven to four? Nine four. Nine four. So, you know, Spencer's done it all year long. I know maybe the competition, you wouldn't think that the competition was as good at uh, 25 as it was at. 285, but if you look at 285, there's really, I mean, Gable's once in a lifetime, 285 pounds. There's not, we haven't seen a lot of heavyweights that wrestle like him. There has been some. Schneider was really, really good. Gwiz was really good, but Gable beat Gwiz, you know, this summer. So, you know, besides that, we haven't seen the Spencer Lee in a long time either, especially at 125. So, I think Spencer was Probably the hot is probably going to win the Hodge. That's who I would vote for if I had a vote. Who's the outstanding wrestler of the tournament? Of the tournament. Boy, that's, you know, that's a tough one, David. If, if I had to give it, I would, I want to say RBY or David Carr from Iowa State. Both of them were so So Shane, Shane Griffith got the award. Yep. And I, I have no problems with Shane getting it. I thought he had a great tournament. I just don't think... RBY beat a better kid in the finals than Shane beat in the finals. And yeah, but he might have beat the best kid in the quarters. Might have. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the draw. So that, that so I would agree with you that Spencer's the Hodge winner. And last year I had a vote. Uh, when I was with track wrestling. I don't know if I get a vote this year. I have to talk to Gary Abbott about that, but he probably will let me sneak one in there. Um, if not. You know, it doesn't matter. But um, I think for the tournament, I think you kind of look at things and you go, like, what was epic, right? Like, what will people be talking about 20 years from now? And I think it's probably Shane Griffith winning for Stanford, like winning his last match in an inside-out black singlet. And that's makes it hard for anybody else to beat that. But it also means he had a super hard path to win it. You know, I mean, he didn't have the support that in a Penn State and an Iowa and an Oklahoma State and some of these other schools have. I mean, we might be looking back on this tournament and going, hey, that's when A.J. Ferrari was first one on his way to a five-time national title. We might be saying the same thing about Carter Starachi. We might be saying Aaron Brooks was on his way to being a four-timer. We might be saying R.B. Wise on his way to being a three-timer. We might be saying Dayton Fix mopped everybody up the last two years, and this is the last time that he took a loss in college. I mean, there's David Carr's on his way to mathematically to being a three-timer. Austin O'Connor, UNC hadn't had a champion since TJ Jaworski in 1995. There's storylines like crazy here. I uh, think they had a lot of really good choices, right? They did. And I don't think they went wrong with Shane. But I don't think that you pick an outstanding wrestler of a tournament because a school – decided well, to drop one of their best programs and dump, you know, 30 kids out on the street saying, you know what, you can go to school here, but you know what, we're not going to have wrestling anymore. Well, it's I remember when I was in high school, I won a bunch of outstanding wrestler awards. And the ones I didn't win was some guy upset somebody else. They're like, well, you were the one seed you were supposed to win. I'm like, well, I would have beat that guy too if we were at the same weight, you know? So there's sort of two ways to look at it, right? Like sure. I think Griffith was under at eight. Right. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, clearly. Right. I mean, he loses to yeah. Valencia and he drops from if he beat Valencia, he was the one, the two seat, the two seat. Yep. And he goes to eight. And I mean, you could have made an argument. He could have been anywhere from three to eight. You know, pretty, sure. pretty solid. All right. So what we're looking at here, if you're watching, guys and gals, is columns, the first eight or nine columns or what the seeds were. If the schools wrestle to seed, okay, but it doesn't include bonus points. 
And then in column M is where they actually finish. So to give you an example, Iowa was seeded to score 126 and a half points. They actually scored 129. Mark and I actually were talking about Iowa on the way to the airport today. And they basically wrestled, nine of their guys wrestled right to seed. Like DeSanto was one better. Cassiope was two better. A couple guys were one or two worse. We counted brands. He might've been one round off, but that's a half a point on the backside. Where they lost a bunch of points was Marinelli was seeded first and was supposed to score 20. And on just on seeds alone, he scored zero. Okay, he scored four points, but none of the first three columns over here count advancement. They count advancement, but not bonus. So he lost out on 18 points. Yep. Penn State, once again, wrestles out of their freaking mind versus where they're seated. They go from 72, and four of their guys alone scored 80 points just on seeds, yep. the four champions, okay? And then they got yeah, Kirk Fleet, All-American, and I can't remember if anybody else did. Oh, Beard. Beard. So they scored 90 points, 91 points on seeds alone, or 93. It's six and a half for seventh, and they had two seven. But they, yep. they scored 93. So they wrestled 21 points above their seat. Uh, North Carolina State, Heidley taking fifth really hurt them. He was seated second, and that's a significant jump. Uh, Deontay Wilson was a guy that I thought could do something. He was seated 10th and didn't, didn't place. That's not a huge drop off, but, you know, that hurts. Tariq Wilson actually wrestled a, one above his seat, which, you know, everybody kind of thought it was a top three and then everybody else, and he cracked that top three. The other team that probably wrestled more above their seeds than anybody else, and they've been criticized, the two teams are Oklahoma State and Arizona State. And they have both taken heat in recent years. I mean, if you, we want to break down Oklahoma State, Mastro wrestles to about his seed. Dayton loses in the finals. Boo wrestles exactly to his seed. They don't qualify at 41. Uh, Wyatt Sheets was 34th, so taken – Eighth is pretty freaking good. Yep. Whitlake was seated 10th and took fourth. Uh, Platt was hurt and did great, but was hurt. Gear was seated 11th and placed in the top six. Ferrari was seated fourth and won it. So they every single one of their guys wrestled two or above seed. That's really impressive. And then Arizona State, Courtney seated third, he takes second. McGee seated ninth. I think he took sixth, but he medaled. Um, 57, Timur was seated 11th and took fourth. Uh, their, their big fallback was Anthony, who was seated second. I think he ended up eighth. He got hurt, but I think we all thought, at least you and me thought, hey, that's not a great draw for him. He's got Wenzel down there. He's got Whitlake down there. He's got O'Toole down there. It's like that bottom half of the bracket was kind of a nightmare, especially if you thought, hey, Makai Lewis is hurt. So that's a guy that's got a top four seed that really isn't there. They they fell back big time with Valencia, and they fell big time with Norfleet because Norfleet was seated third in DNP. And they still took fourth. Like if yep. Valencia makes the finals and Norfleet takes third, they're right there for third. I mean, they're right there. So Minnesota had the most falls in the tournament, which I thought was really interesting. Um, we talked about Patrick McKee, but that guy just was decking fools. Like somebody put a post out, and we got to get you on Twitter, man, because um, I have to call you and tell you about all this stuff. But somebody tweeted that Minnesota had seven falls, and Gable Stevenson said, well, Patrick had three, and the rest of us were just along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was freaking awesome, <laughs> you know, that the leader of the team did that that way, you know, but he, he, he helped them. And, and Minnesota just grinds out top 10 finishes. They don't get a lot of uh, pub. Ohio State was down all year, and they finish in the top 10. Northwestern finishes in the top 10 with Deacon not making the finals. So I think the teams that kind of fell out that were – Way to go, Yaya. I mean, he helped him immensely. Yeah, that would help you and me immensely, too. So yeah. uh, the two teams, I think, that finished significantly below where they were seated was Nebraska and Virginia Tech, right? Like Nebraska was seated sixth, and they finished 12th. Virginia Tech was seated fourth and took 15th. 
Now, if you take the 13 and a half, 12 and a half points off for uh, Mackay, you know, which Virginia Tech probably knew he wasn't going to place. And we had that, talked about this, David, earlier that Virginia Tech was ranked really high. And we said, you know, if Mackay cannot perform up to his abilities, they're going to lose a lot of points and it's going to drop them way down. And that's exactly what happened. And right. they lost, and 25 killed them. Latona well, didn't, didn't make the finals. He didn't even place. Latona didn't place. place. Okay. So he DMPs from the two hole. Yep. Um, Corbin Myers falls back a spot or two. I mean, they just had a couple guys that, but they still, they had a post. They had three All American. No, Latona placed. No, he didn't. Okay. We'll check it out, but I don't think he did. This is good stuff. We, we're double checking each he other. Took six, Mark. Latona took six. Lost to Lamont for fifth. Just okay. tr trust me. My bad. Yeah. I, kn I knew he sure. played. Okay. I knew he placed. Because they had three All Americans, and they've had three All Americans or more for eight straight years. So okay. I think what it says about Virginia Tech is how good are they that that's a down year for them, right? There's a yeah. lot of programs that three All Americans would be huge. You know, you're right. So, and Tony Roby is going to have those guys back and you add Makai in the mix next year and he's got to be a title contender, no matter if he goes 65, 74, tiddlywinks way, whatever. That guy's yep. le legit as hell. So, you know, even if you punch him in for like third place points, they jump to, they jump above Ohio State. You know, and then Ohio State's going to add like Carson Karchler. Like next year is going to be insane. Because nobody's technically gone. And then you bring all these red shirts back. You bring back injured guys. You bring in new freshmen. And you bring in the Ivy Leagues. Basically, Cornell and Princeton. Yep. So, I think there's going to be a lot more dispersion. Among, like, I think if you told Iowa right now you could have 129 points next year, I think they would take it. I think it's going to be harder to get to that. I, I agree. It is going to be harder. And I think you're going to – I think, like, if I had to guess right now – and we picked in our pool, we picked 136 points to win and Penn State second at 105. And if Jaden Ironman beats Nick Lee, they're at 133 and 109 and a half. Yep. So really close. We were really close. Yep. So, or if Kemmer wins. Yeah, if Kemmer – yeah. He was Kemmer probably wins. more of a favorite than uh, – Well, actually, if Kemmer and Jaden win – they're at 137 and 105 and a half. We basically hit it right on the dot. Yep. So, but yeah. I, great I guess to me, Nebraska was probably had the most disappointing weekend of all the teams that are up there. Uh, I know that's hard on Mark Manning because in the last couple of years, they've wrestled so well during the year. And, uh, you know, I think when Schultz got belly rolled to his back and stuck, I think it just took the wind out of them because then the next round, you know, they lose the number five seed to Murin, who they had beaten. Uh, two love it. Four yeah. in the Big Tens. Love it. So, yeah. I mean, you could see the wind going out of them, and it just – it never, they couldn't stop it. You know, sometimes when that ball gets rolling, you just can't stop it. It doesn't matter what you do. So I think when you've coached long enough, you get – snowballed good and bad sometimes kids just start pinning people and you're like you just clap and hand them their, their sweats when they run off yeah I knew you could do that yeah okay no I mean like and then sometimes it goes the other way right like where it doesn't matter what you say it's just you're losing every close match you yep. know it's rough so yep. but again I mean they had several All-Americans you know what hurt them big time was Schultz DNP'd and Venn's DNP'd and those are guys that you expect to place for them Yep. I mean, and if those guys even place, they're in the top 10. Yeah. I mean, because that's minimum of 11 points. So, I mean, that puts I them would, up there. Hey, but if I would have said over and under is Nebraska's at 40 points at the national tournament. I'd have taken the over for sure. All, all day long. So all day long and twice on Sunday. Yeah. It, it was real disappointing to see that. Uh, I think Iowa State, you know, they had two kids that performed really, really well. But – 
besides that, it wasn't a real impressive tournament for them. You know, I, I thought they'd play at uh, 41, and, and they did. So, you know. Yeah, they lost the first round to a kid who's coached by my friend. Was, his kid's club was Jason Keck. He, he wrestled in Border Brawl, too, and he's a real funky kid on top. Like, if you've never felt him before, he's not great on his feet. He kind of rolls around with you and lets you get to his legs and, you know, does the clingy stuff, and you, you think you got him, and then you pick down, and that's a bad choice, and that's what happened. So, let's yeah. go to the All Americans, David, by conferences. Okay, so this should be down here. There you go. So you put this in here. So yep. Big Ten with thirty-five, Big Twelve with sixteen, ACC with twelve, Pac. That should be the Pac twelve with nine, but that's fine. The MAC with four, the EIWA with three, the SoCon with one. I think probably the big thing that sticks out is the EIWA with all those extra bids this year. You know, they ate up a lot of bids and didn't produce a lot of All-Americans. A lot of people are saying the ACC was the second best conference. I think Big 12, uh, at least with more All-Americans and at least two champions right off the top of my head with Carr and Ferrari, yep. you know, probably solidified themselves at the second best conference. Um, and the Pac-12 was, you know, large, what's well, three schools basically, right? It was Arizona State, Stanford, and Cal Poly. So, uh, and the MAC is probably going to get thinner because I think Missouri's going to the Big 12. Everything I'm hearing is in the next two years are going to the Big 12. Yeah. So, you and know. that's kind of what they wanted to do. They, you know, changing conferences, that was great for their football and basketball programs. But obviously, you know, there is no wrestling programs in that conference. And then they got thrown over to the MAC and they enjoyed it when you and I was there. And it was a little bit tougher, North Dakota. And then all of a sudden, those teams go to the Big 12, and they're sitting there wrestling. You know, they had nine guys that – eight guys were in the freaking finals of their conference tournament. Well, it's a little wonky. They're an SEC school with SEC money wrestling in a mid-major conference. I don't think they want to be there probably any more than those guys want them there. Like, people have criticized Mizzou's schedule, but to be fair, Mizzou has to wrestle so many of these duels. Like, they can't just say – hey, we'll just show up and see you at conference and see us wherever you want. Like, they're required to wrestle so many duels. Like, they have to wrestle the Riders, the SIUs, you know, the, the old Dominions when they had a team like those schools. They have to wrestle them. Like, they would, they've always tried to duel Oklahoma State. They, they wanted to duel Iowa. You know, they dueled Iowa. They're one of the few teams that ever beat Iowa in Iowa in the national yeah. duels. So, all right, so what we're looking at here is the last chance qualifier – these are the seeds that came out. And, you know, I talked to the guys at USA Wrestling. We're going to cover all three weights. In Greco, there's only two seeded guys at 60, 67, 77, 87, 97, and 130. So if they, I would assume that means those are the only guys weighed in or, or registered. Now, if that happens, those guys probably won't even wrestle because there's no reason to. They both qualify, and you just don't want to take a chance on getting hurt. At the women's weight, at 76, there's two. At 68, there's four. Kennedy Blades is the four seed. She's really young, but really good. I mean, she, this is probably a really long shot for her to make it with, with the people that we have as a country at 68 kilos. But she's an up and rising star people should keep an eye on. Two at 62, uh, four at 57. Uh, the four seed here has made a national team before. Gracie Figueroa is a really talented young girl out of California. Four girls at 53, four girls at 50. In Greco, I'm sorry, this is freestyle now, 125 pounds. So trying to get this thing to stop pulling. So Derek White, Tanner Hall, Jordan Wood, Micah Soy, Danny Chate, uh, Saran Francisco, Mario Corrente, uh, Moral Corrente, and Zach Elam. So Got a guy like Elam who's knocked on the door a couple of times. Derek White, Tanner Hall, Jordan Wood, all guys have been All-Americans. So not a great draw for Derek White if these are the seeds to get a Zach Elam in the quarterfinals. Like, yeah. not ideal. Um, at 97, Ben Honus, Austin Schaefer, Scotty Boykin, Braxton Amos, Michael Boykin, Morgan Smith, Gavin Hoffman. So I thought Austin Schaefer had taken a break. He probably did. Braxton Amos is probably the young guy in this group when you're looking at the next quad, and it's only a three-year quad now, so I don't know what we'd use instead of quad, but 24, he's a guy to keep an eye on. 86 kilos. This might be the best weight at the tournament. 
Gabe Dean, Nate Jackson, Mark Hall, Drew Foster, David McFadden, Taylor Lujan, Max Dean, CJ Brook. Only two of them dudes are getting through. Yeah. So that's going to be a great weight to watch. 74 kilos. Ryan Deacon, Alec Pantaleo, Chance Marsteller, Tyler Berger, Vincenzo Joseph, Joey LaValle, Joshua Shields, Julian Ramirez. Ramirez Another is Another re really good weight. That's a good weight. Yep. Really good weight. Pantaleo did a lot of damage. He's a tweener. That 70 kilos is really perfect for him. He's too big yep. for 65. I think he's probably going to wrestle 70 for the next two years and then probably, you know, work on getting where he's cutting more weight for that. 65 kilos. So Lugo, Henderson, McKee, Pletcher, Kaladzic, Heil, Fawz, Mack. The first thing I saw, I called you. I'm like, Jay Nyrum is not listed in here. Okay. Right. People forget when you win the Nationals, that's an automatic spot in the trials. Like AJ Ferrari's in the trials. Now, what's interesting was a bunch of these guys were already in. Gable was already in. Spencer Lee was already in. RBY is kind of bit, I don't think he's going to go wrestle 65 kilos. It's just a question of whether he can make, make it down to 25, 57 kilos, 125 and a half, which I think is going to be really hard for him. Nick yeah. Lee was already in. Austin O'Connor will probably wrestle. I mean, you wrestle in that event if you can. It's help, nothing but help you grow. David Carr was already in. Shane Griffith, I guess, would probably wrestle. His stock couldn't get any higher. Jeez. You know, um, Brooks is already in at 84. Starachi, I don't think he can make it down to 74 kilos. and He'd be really small at 86. Him and RBY got, are those two in-between weights. Yep. And then we talked about Ferrari. And we talk, Gable's obviously going to be the number two seed at the, at the tournament. So... This, but this weight's really interesting with no Jaden. And again, I think guys could still enter. I don't know. Zane Richards, Jack Mueller, Darian Cruz, Frank Pirelli, Daniel DeShazer, Sean Russell, Austin Miller, Matthew Ramos. Three go for RTC guys, and they've already got a fourth one in in the tournament at Zach Sanders. Yep. So we're recording this on Wednesday, late night, on Thursday. And the podcast won't come out till Friday. So when you're watching and listening to this, the pre-seeds will be out. I spoke to Gary Abbott. I spoke to Kevin Jackson. They both told me there's a formula. You, We all saw the article today that said RTC and the Cups and all these other events on Flow and Rockfin and Track, all these events are counting. Now, what's interesting about that, none of those events were the – I don't think any of them, anybody made scratch weight. There's a couple of them like was 150 pound bracket, 195 pound bracket. And most of them were three kilos, which is 6.6 .6 pounds if you don't speak kilo. And most of them were like a lot longer weigh in time too than one hour, two hours. But it was super interesting. You and me have talked about this a bunch. And I told you, I'm like, I think they're going to count them because otherwise, you know, it's basically minimizing all these events. And that's the last thing that anybody wanted to do. You know, people that put these events on really sort of saved wrestling during the pandemic. You have to reward them for that. So it's going to be fascinating. You and me talked about it and we'll wait till next week. You know, yeah, because, because I think they're going to be, they're going to see uh, at the first wait, they're going to be surprised who the number one seed is going to be. So No, we can talk about that real quick. But what we're saying is we don't even know who's in the field because all these guys that we're looking at right now on the chart and girls, two yep. of them are going to get in at every weight, okay? Right. And somebody could still enter. Jaden Ironman could still enter, and he would go right to the top of the list of seeds, and he would actually be a guy that would get seated in the bracket. But the one thing that I called Gary Abbott this afternoon from the airport, and he told me, he said, go in and look at the criteria. So I went in and looked at the criteria. Here's the thing that everybody knows. If you medaled in an Olympic weight at the last world championships and on the men's freestyle side, that's Burroughs and that's Snyder. Like on the women's side, that's like uh, Adeline Gray, those kind of people. You sit till the final. So the whole bracket gets wrestled and the winner comes to you. If you medaled at a non-Olympic weight and most, of, most people follow men's freestyle. So that's Kyle Dake and that's Jaden Cox. Those guys have a buy to the semis, and they're on the bottom side. So if you're the one seed in the bracket, I'm the two seed in the bracket. I get, I wrestled three, 
And then I, my reward is I get Jaden. And then the winner of that match gets you. And then the winner of that match gets Snyder at two out of three. But here's the one that I didn't know. And there's a, you have to look at this language because they talk about matches that count and don't count. But they talk about from the 2019 tournament, I'm not sure they're going to count all those because that's using two years worth. And when they originally wrote it, it was one year. But here's the thing. If you qualified the weight for the Olympics, for the Olympics, which is at the Pan Am Games, and you're not sitting to the finals, okay? You're the number one seed in the bracket. So I'm just going to walk through men's freestyle. That means Thomas Gilman is the one seed. At 65, Zane lost to the Argentinian. So he'll probably still be the one seed, but it's not an automatic. Uh, 74, someone's going to be the one seed, but they're technically the three seed because they got to get through Dake and get to Burroughs. At 86, David Taylor qualified the weight. So he's the one seed. 97, Snyder's the one, Jaden's the two, whoever else the guy is the three, and Snyder's the one that qualified the weight. But Gwiz qualified the weight. What's interesting about that is he lost at that RTC Cup to Paris and to Gable Stevenson. Yep. And those guys actually made weight because six, six pounds there probably didn't make any difference because it's, you know, it's heavyweight. 275. Is it 125 kilos? 275. Yes. You're right. Correct. So I don't think any of those guys weigh 280. So, <laughs> but what that means is, and we got about three minutes left, that Gwiz is the one. So Gable and Paris are on the same side of the bracket. So we're going to talk Monday about how the last chance went and the pre-seeds and how that all happens, and we'll probably try to guess. There's a seeding meeting on Monday via Zoom. I was told that much. I offered to donate. I guess I can announce this. I offered to donate my salary. I'm doing one of the play-by-play -play mats at the Olympic trials. I offered to donate my salary to sit in on those seating meetings. It has not been accepted yet, but I, <laughs> I don't even want to tell everybody what happened. I just want to hear what happens. Mm -hmm. but I don't think it's going to happen. So um, I think now when Mike Willis listens, this is definitely not going to happen. But I just want to sit in on it and see how they get to that. And it's a lot of it's jockeying because like if – Take real quick, we got about a minute left. If Spencer Lee enters, normally that would be a bad draw, but if he has no knees, you might want that draw. And then a lot of these other ones are matchups. Like, I can't, you know, you can beat everybody, but this one guy, and he's problematic for you. You just want to be on the other side of the bracket as him. I think that's what's going to happen. There's going to be chaos at uh, 57 kilos in men's freestyle, chaos at 65. And uh, a little bit of chaos after the number one seed at 86. Those those three weights for sure. Yeah. Uh, you got about 20 seconds if you want to sign off with anything. No, I'm good. I thought it, uh, it's just too bad we got to wait another year for the NCAAs <laughs> because, you know, we waited so long for it. Now we're going to have to wait another year. But it was so nice to see them guys back there wrestling. So we got NCAAs. We got last chance. We got Olympic trials. We got junior duels. We got U15s, we got cadets, we got Fargo, we got the Olympics. I'm not going to be sad till like September, and then that's when I'm going to run Border Brawl. So we're good for a while. <laughs> it's wrestling junkie time. All so, right. Everybody, thank you guys for watching, listening, sharing, tweeting, everything else. For Mark Ostrander, I'm David Mercatani. Thank you guys for everything.